If you have acid reflux, you are in very good company. Over 95 million Americans suffer from it. And we are now learning that 75 to 100 percent of those with acid reflux have a hiatal hernia. So what I want to talk to you today about is the barrier function that your body has inherently and it's called an anti-reflux barrier. There's three components to it and I'm going to go over that. So we have this beautiful system. Your body knows how important it is to not allow stomach acid to reflux into your esophagus. It is so aware of that that it created an anti-reflux barrier with three different structural components to ensure that that never happens other than of course the occasional vomiting you get food poisoning and then it's you know good to get that out of you but other than extreme circumstances the body is really set up to make sure you don't have acid reflux so what happens so first of all let's go over the three parts of the anti-reflux barrier um, the first one is called the lower esophageal sphincter this is just a valve as you know your mouth connects to your stomach via your esophagus and it has sphincters or valves there's an upper one and there's a lower one so the anatomy you need to know is that you you have your diaphragm and that brings air in and out of your lungs uh, but in order for the esophagus to connect to your stomach there has to be an opening in your diaphragm and your esophagus passes through that opening and then your stomach sits on the left side this is my left side uh, just below the diaphragm so you have what's called a lower sphincter a lower esophageal sphincter or valve and that sits below the diaphragm that's where it should sit and it's just right where the esophagus then turns into the stomach and it's this valve again that makes sure that as uh, beverages and food are going down your esophagus that they they go in the right direction top down that's the only direction it's designed to go so it just it, it opens when it senses uh, liquid or food and then it, it closes again as, and it's a nice pressure to keep everything down so that's the lower esophageal sphincter again just right above where where the esophagus connects to the stomach just right at the very bottom of the esophagus and below the diaphragm. Then we have what's called the crural diaphragm. And this is, it's amazing, the diaphragm is a very large structure, but you have tendons from your lower back. So the vertebrae of your lower back are called your lumbar vertebrae, and you have five of them. And the top two to three send tendons um, up to, to the diaphragm and create a sphincter-like uh, basically structure that is a bit distinct from the diaphragm. So it's just right around that opening. So remember I said there's the diaphragm, you've got the two domes, you've got that opening that the esophagus passes through and the crural diaphragm is, is again this valve that goes around that opening that acts like another valve to keep things in the right direction, not, not reflexing back the other way. And it's a tendinous structure, so you've got tendons in your body that actually come from your lower back, okay? So uh, again, the diaphragm is a vast structure, and, and your, the main part of your diaphragm is bringing air in and out, but this is a muscular section that's, again, right around that opening to, to act as another valve. So that's a backup valve in your anti-reflux uh, barrier. And then lastly, you have a ligament, and it's called a phrenoesophageal. Phreno just means diaphragm, esophageal means esophagus. So it's a big word, but it just means uh, a ligament that, that is involved in the diaphragm and the esophagus. And so what it does is it anchors your esophagus and your diaphragm, so it, it below it anchors it so that your the esophagus and the diaphragm are, are sort of anchored with this like a sling-like ligament keeping that juncture of, of this, the lower esophagus before it becomes the stomach, 
keeping it below the diaphragm. So all of these structures, the diaphragm kind of demarcates your chest, which is where you know your heart, your lungs, etc., are. And so then the diaphragm demarcates that from your abdomen, which is where all your digestive organs are. So this ligament is designed to, to keep the um, esophagus below the diaphragm where, where it meets the stomach. So again, it's another backup to make sure that, that that esophagus can't get pulled up into the chest, the lower esophagus. Of course, the whole entire esophagus passes from your mouth down into your stomach. But that it's, it's that lower part that we're looking at here because that's what that's where reflux takes place, is that there's that pressure. Speaking of pressure, these three constituents of this anti-reflux barrier, they're keeping a pressure uh, to prevent reflux. So they're, 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 they're the sphincter, it's a barrier, it's, it's holding everything down. So there's this pressure of saying, we gotta keep it down, we gotta keep it in the stomach, don't let it come back up. So how does it go so awry? How, do, how does nine, over 95 million Americans have reflux? What's happening? What occurs is that pressure, that good pressure, gets overwhelmed by what's called increased intra-abdominal pressure. So all of this is in the abdomen, right? The stomach is in your abdomen, should be, unless you have a hiatal hernia where part of it goes up. But the stomach's there, obviously that lower part of the esophagus is there. You know, there's that nice inward pressure keeping everything in the stomach by design. But then you get enough pressure from the outside, and I talk about this a lot, is that pressure that's squeezing the stomach and then just sort of blows all the other <laughs> good measures that your body has inherently out of the water and you get and you get reflux. So let's look at where those pressures come from. Constipation is very common. 20% of all adults in the US have constipation. I think it could be even higher um, because these, these um, percentages are coming from individuals who are complaining about constipation. I have met patients over my many decades in practice who are constipated and have no idea that they are because they move their bowels every two days, every three days, and they've always moved their bowels that infrequently. And they consider it to be normal because like, well, that's just me. That's what my body does. Well, they're constipated and they don't even know it. So I would wager that that's a higher percentage. But anyway, that's what the, the research says. Then there's uh, gas and bloating, which only makes sense that gas is putting a lot of pressure. So gas and bloating um, constitutes, uh, based on a very recent study just a couple of months ago 20, in 2025, that 40% of Americans suffer from gas and bloating. So the percentages are rising here. And um, that's from IBS can do it, certainly food sensitivities can do it, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can do it. There's a lot of things that can cause gas and bloating, but that's certainly going to increase uh, intra-abdominal pressure. Fatty liver, so fat infiltration in the liver, 25% of American adults have that. The liver is a very large organ. I, I pointed to the stomach being on the left side, uh, just under the rib cage. Uh, the liver is, is, on, um, is on the right side. And uh, what happens is that that liver gets infiltrated with fat and it's, and it's taking up more room and it's inflamed and that can increase pressure, certainly in that area because they're like cousins on, on the left and, and right side of the body respectively. Um, then there's just general inflammation which uh, is, comes about from a number of different issues but we do know that inflammation is the root cause of pretty much every degenerative disease we're trying to avoid. That accounts for 35% of adults. Then there's leaky gut. So that's a big one. And leaky gut has to do with the fact that your, your gut from your mouth to your anus is actually a closed system that's considered outside the body. So you have to think with this because obviously it's not hanging outside your body. But it's outside from the viewpoint that um, your body is very smart, which is why 
anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of your immune system is housed in your gut. It's, it's predominantly in the lining of, of the gut, lining of the tube, that makes sure, it's in trying to make sure, that bad guys don't leave your gut and go out into circulation. So if something's leaving the gut and going into your bloodstream, now it's considered inside your body. If it's staying in the gut and the body can keep it there and either you know poop it out when it's done with it and says you're not welcome inside my body, or the immune system goes to work on it, you know, where it lies, and, and then the remnants are pooped out. H however it's pooped out, that is what the gut is designed to do, is to make sure no bad guys enter. But with inflammation, poor diet, a, a lot of different, um, you know, the highly refined diets that we have, chemicals in our environment, on and on and on, what we get is this leaky gut, which is increased permeability. So that lining, instead of being that nice barrier that has this intelligence to it, the immune system gives it this intelligence that says, oh, you're a good guy, you know, you're welcome into my bloodstream and, and go do your, your wonderful good guy things, you know, nourishing and anti-inflammation and protecting and healing, all the lovely things that, that we want um, good nutrition and good substances to do, versus, again, the intelligence then also detects you're a bad guy, you know, you're a parasite, you're a bad chemical, etc. cetera, uh, you're mold, you're heavy metal, I'm not letting you in. So, so that's the intelligence of a healthy functioning gut. Uh, when there's too much overwhelm on that immune system, we, we lose the integrity and um, really the, the brilliance of the immune system and sort of the, the, the number of immune cells that should be protecting us and that goes down and there's you know not enough guards at the gate is an easy way to think about it and then we've got this increased permeability known as leaky gut. So uh, leaky gut creates inflammation that creates increased intra-abdominal pressure certainly and it's considered 80 to 90 percent of adults have some sort of leaky gut so that's obviously a huge percentage so we're talking about larger and larger percentages here um, and then we also have obesity or and overweight so Overweight is 74% of the population, obese 43% of the population. And with obesity, we have increased intra-abdominal fat, which is increasing, in, it's increasing intra-abdominal pressure. So the people with the, the big bellies, the central adiposity it's called, the apple shape, uh, shape of the body, all of that, that extra fat in that location we're not talking about you know extra weight in your butt or extra weight in your thighs or in your arms we're talking about that gut weight that that's the dangerous weight and that's increasing intra-abdominal pressure so those are all the things creating this increased pressure that's overwhelming your natural anti-reflux barrier. So it's very mechanical, if you will, right? It's one pressure outweighing another pressure. So what do we do about it? We assess where do you fall into that category of things that I just mentioned. Now certainly people can be constipated and have a leaky gut and have another source of inflammation and maybe have a food sensitivity. You know, they can have several of those things, but what is it for you? That's what we figure out is what are these stress factors, these inflammatory factors that are leading to this increased pressure that's overwhelming this anti-reflux barrier? Um, because that's what's happening. That, that barrier knows how to do its job, but we're overwhelming it. And when you stop overwhelming it, then it can get back to doing its job. So. It is very mechanical, that's what I want to get across. And when you take the pressure off, when you take that extra pressure off these valves and sphincters, they will, generally speaking, be able to function again. And so a lot of times people say, oh, you know, my lower esophageal sphincter, it's weak. Okay, have you ever had a, you know, a weak muscle and then you built it up? You know, have you ever had an injury and then you healed from it? The human body loves to heal. It's 
very efficient. It's very strong at healing itself. And you remove the barriers to why it's not healing and, and it will heal. So that's so much of what we do here. We say, what's overwhelming your body? What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? And we go down a comprehensive list and it's not 85 things. It's probably three to four things, but we go deep dive into that and handle it. And not only is your just overall health improving, but now we don't have the reflux anymore. Now we don't need to stay on the dangerous PPI or hopefully not even get on the PPI um, proton pump inhibitor that people are given for acid reflux. So um, that's what I wanted to get across to you today is that this is a very mechanical problem and it can be solved mechanically. Now I mentioned the gut a lot, you know, your, your gastrointestinal tract, but there also is the diaphragm itself, sort of resetting, rebalancing the diaphragm. And also there's the vagus nerve, which goes to all these sphincters and um, kind of a allows them to function well, including uh, the phrenoesophageal ligament that I mentioned, there's a vagus nerve input there as well. So anything to do with the gut has, has a lot to do with the vagus nerve. So we want to normalize vagus nerve function in addition to normalizing the gut and then resetting the diaphragm as appropriate based on how long you've had um, the problem and the irritation to it. So I hope that makes sense. The good news is that this is very fixable in the vast majority of cases. It's a natural program. There's no drugs. There's no surgery and it works beautifully. I mean, you have to be ready and willing to make some diet and lifestyle changes, for sure. There's not a magic pill. I know we all wish there was one, but there isn't. It, this is a beautiful, complex machine that you own, and um, while it loves to heal and repair, you have to do the right things for it, and that's what we help you with. So if you enjoyed this content, please consider subscribing to the channel. We're trying to uh, build up our subscribers so that more people can be exposed to this information and improve their health and enjoy what great health brings. Um, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up, share it with others who you know suffer with this problem. And uh, I very much appreciate you and we'll talk soon.